message. Um, and hopefully, we're pretty much ready to go, Derek. Thanks, Sue. Um, am I coming through okay? You are. Great. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and, and welcome to this webinar. I'll just confirm that it is uh, a, a follow on webinar directly from the updated Joint Professional Bodies Guidance that we published last week for audiology and otology during the COVID 19 pandemic. So, hopefully, you're all in the right place. Um, could I have this next slide, please, Sue? So I am Derek Hoare and I'm the chair of the British Society of Audiology and I'm joined on the panel today by Karen Shepherd, who is president of the British Academy of Audiology, Sue Falkingham, who's immediate past president of the British Academy of Audiology, Rennie Ganguly, who's chairman of the Association of Independent Hearing Healthcare Practitioners, and Andrew Coulter is president of the British Society of Hearing Aid Audiologists, uh, and delighted to be joined also by Professor Peter Ray. So, um, Professor Ray is kindly joining us. Uh, and he is uh, an ENT consultant and president of the British Society of Autology and also uh, and co author on the ENT guidance. Uh, so, we're looking forward to hearing some thoughts from uh, Professor Ray in a few moments. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Okay, so I'm just going to um, run through the, the, the plan for this webinar. I'm going to start by giving a very brief summary of the guidance. Uh, we'll then have a, a briefing from Professor Ray to give uh, his perspective from an ENT and British Society of Autology pers uh, perspective on the, the guidance and on their own guidance. Uh, we'll then move on to the Q&A. So we'll start off with some questions that were submitted prior by email. Uh, and then with what time we have left, so we have about an hour in total uh, we'll take some questions that have been submitted by, by you, the audience, um, as, we, as we go through the session. So I think we had um, nearly 700 people sign up, and the majority of those are already online, and I'm sure that will increase in the next few minutes. Um, so obviously we may not get to everybody's individual questions today, or indeed have the answers that, that people need for those individual questions today. Um, however, we will be recording this webinar, uh, so it will be made available to everybody afterwards, including those who, who were unable to attend. Um, and we're also going to produce uh, answers to those frequently asked questions. So we have had a lot of questions already submitted, so we'll provide some high-level answers uh, and some more detailed answers to those frequently asked questions and tailor them also for, for clinicians and for the public. And, and we hope to make that all available very soon. Okay, so next slide, please, Sue. Um, firstly, I think it's important to state that this guidance is a minimum standard recommendation, and it really should be viewed as the starting point for, for you to create your own local standard operating procedures to adapt your workspaces, create the appropriate patient information that you need, that will make this guidance practicable in your individual setting. So there are elements throughout that, that people will acknowledge and, and, and feel are open to interpretation and indeed need to be. There is, so, there is that leeway to adapt also to, to local policy and, and requirements. So in terms of this updated guidance then, what has changed? Well, the initial guidance was very cautious and based on prior evidence and safety precautions that were related to the virus in the blood and in other um, upper respiratory tract samples and precaution levels that were uh, devised around blood for transfusion, for example. Um, so these are clearly very strict um, strict precautions that were in place that we were, we were viewing um, just a few weeks ago. But as we're learning more now about the behavior of the virus, we can start to uh, advise on how to now start to do things safely. So this guides therefore moves away from that focus on only doing what is essential or urgent and to what you need to do to deliver a service that is safe for you and safe for your patients and your customers 
and those patients and customers who you have triaged as having an unmet audiological need. And when we, when we say unmet audiological need, what we mean by this is that they are someone who has been identified as having a hearing problem and that it is having a negative impact either on their quality of life, their ability to work, their ability to communicate, etc. But of course, it's important to, to recognize that we are still in this period of sustained transmission. So we are advising still against new assessments for those who do not at triage appear to have an unmet audiological need. We recommend triage is done remotely uh, and a service delivered remotely wherever practicable. And so within the new guidance, then you'll find a flow diagram as Appendix 3 and that should hopefully support your decision making here. And that's, that's the diagram that's, that's shown here. Um, OK, could I have the next slide, please, Sue? So, so what is the evidence? Um, thanks first to uh, Professor uh, Jenny Wilson and the Infection Prevention Society, uh, who provided some very useful uh, answers to some quite critical questions. And these, again, are included within appendices uh, within the updated guidance. Uh, just in brief, Firstly, we don't have evidence for, for airborne transmission of COVID-19. Um, when I'm talking about when, in that respect, um, there are a number of studies that are starting to appear in the literature, albeit some of these are, are published quite rapidly, so those are not necessarily peer reviewed. Uh, but those studies do show, they uh, starting to show the, the distribution and the survival profiles of the virus in healthcare spaces as a result of respiratory droplets. So when we're talking specifically about these respiratory droplets, we're talking about um, droplets that are produced naturally through breathing, talking, sneezing, coughing, vomiting. These are mainly water, relatively large in size, so at least five microns in size, which is quite small, but also very large in, in terms of uh, a liquid volume. So they fall to the ground quite rapidly um, or onto other surfaces quite rapidly once they've been expelled from the body. But these studies so far uh, are really showing evidence for environmental contamination, so contamination of surfaces, essentially high touch surfaces, especially high touch surfaces. And, and so these studies are concluding that um, this, um, the, the, the surface uh, contamination is an important factor in transmission. But we don't have evidence, any evidence to show COVID-19 transmission in air as a result of these respiratory droplets. Uh, it's, it's a surface contamination. Um, so in the case of these large respiratory droplets then, uh, what, what is really crucial to think about is regularly cleaning the environment, so using detergent or chlorine-based solution, um, and especially those surfaces that are regularly touched. So those high-touch surfaces, things like like the chair handles, the door handles, any equipment that you're using regularly. And important to you to, rec to, to just acknowledge that gloves here will not protect you unless they are rigorous, uh, rigorously used and you consciously avoid touching your own mouth or nose area with your hands. So, so that's a, obviously a no-no regardless of whether you're wearing gloves or not uh, within, within your clinical setting. So next slide, please, Sue. Aerosols. Um, aerosols are, are a different scenario. So um, by aerosols, we're talking about artificially generated small particles. So referred to here also as, as droplet nuclei. So these are typically much smaller than these respiratory droplets. So unlike those respiratory droplets, these droplet nuclei can linger in the air. Um, and there are a number of aerosol generating procedures that have been highlighted by gov.uk. So these are things such as tracheal intubation, tracheostomy, non-invasive ventilation. And these do appear, and certainly there is some literature to suggest, um, that they do pose an increased risk of, of transmission of COVID-19 uh, in the air. And um, however, thinking about audiological practice, um, Earwax removal using microsuction, procedures that generally um, may induce coughing, uh, do not generate droplets of that size. So, so they're not like aerosol generating procedures. 
And we do, of course, recommend use of disposable gloves for any direct contact with bodily fluids, so things like earwax and drivel, um, depending on, on the situation. Not necessarily for every contact with a patient, um, although risk obviously should always be assessed. So the next slide, please, Sue. So, so based on that available evidence, recommendations and practical considerations, uh, on page 22 of the guideline, we now provide this table. So this summarizes our recommendations in terms of physical distancing from the, from the patient or the customer. So maintaining that two meter distance as much as possible. So whenever you can, you know, during history taking, explanations, et cetera. Um, and for procedures where you need that close contact, um, you need to assess whether the procedure represents first a low or a high risk of splash, droplets of blood, body fluids. In all cases, um, procedures should be risk assessed, in any, of course, um, and comply with local policy. Within this guidance, this new updated guidance, there is some room for discretion here. So for example, gloves, as I've just mentioned, um, are recommended. However, they may significantly impede dexterity for some procedures, and so good hygiene, um, good hand hygiene may be sufficient in those cases. Uh, in the case of any procedure in clinic within that two meter um, distance, we do recommend use of a, a fluid resistant surgical mask, um, and that you ask the patient or the customer to use one also. Uh, if they have a, a significant other who is, is requires to be with them, uh, then they too should be wearing or uh, asked to wear one of these fluid resistant surgical masks. Um, and where there's a high risk of splash, then full personal protective equipment, so gloves, apron, mask, some form of eye protection is recommended. And in all scenarios, of course, um, it's essential to keep on top of hand and respiratory hygiene. Uh, next slide, please, Sue. Just to continue that, that last point, um, the guidance also provides links to online hand hygiene training from the World Health Organization, Public Health England and NHS England. And um, we, we certainly strongly encourage everybody to, to take the time to revisit that training. Um, there's also a link within the guidance, um, brief but important information on respiratory hygiene, cough etiquette, and um, so the things that uh, we're all familiar with, uh, so catch it, bin it, kill it safely, uh, very important that we're, we're um, disposing of these materials safely. And this latter information also includes um, details about consistent provision for patients and customers uh, within, your, within your settings. So um, the provision of, of tissues, for example, no touch bins for tissue disposal, hand sanitizer, supplies for hand washing, um, all, the, all the basics that we really need to think about having in, in as all or as many clinical areas as possible, including, including waiting rooms. So that's a, a kind of a whistle stop on the, the guidance, um, hopefully fills in a few gaps for some individuals. And there are a few questions which have clearly arisen, which we'll, we'll come to uh, in, in a few moments time. But with that, uh, I'd just like to um, hand over and introduce uh, and thank again Professor Ray for being here today from British Society of Audiology and, and look forward to hearing your, your thoughts on the guidance and just some, a brief on where your own guidance is. Thank you very much indeed. Can you hear me okay there? Yeah, perfectly. Yeah, great, great stuff. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. And um, I really enjoyed reading the guidance. I'd like to thank uh, Karen as well for sharing them with me as they were developed. Um, I think they're a really helpful step forward. Um, from our perspective, I'm president of British Society of Otology, so I represent ENT surgeons in the UK primarily. And one of the things we are really keen on when we're producing our own guidelines is that we have all other stakeholders, whether it's government or colleagues such as yourselves, um, really singing from the same hymn sheet. I don't think it's helpful at all for uh, society if we're all giving different guidelines. So it was really helpful reading through what you said. My, my starting point is as an ENT surgeon, you know, to be afraid of the virus. It's, it's not a great thing. You, you may well know we had a, a colleague die in Leicester from um, COVID infection. We've had another colleague recently very ill from it. So there's no question that this is something to be taken seriously and something to be careful with. Um, 
I would just be a little cautious when considering um, advice regarding airborne transmission and cough. Um, this is a respiratory virus, and you know if you're coughed over, I wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of that cough. Is the bottom line. So I'd be pretty careful. Now it it does have some implications for face masks, and I think we need to be really careful with face masks because if you're going to be close to a patient um, cleaning their ear, it is likely you're going to want to wear a face mask and they're going to want to. But just remember, if they cough, the the outflow of the cough is going to be directed laterally because of the face mask and might be directed towards you. So I, th I think you you know think really carefully. The, the bottom line is the evidence isn't there. Um, turning to your guidelines, I think I think they're very solid. And I, I, as I said to Karen, I really think they're a step forward. They're really helpful. Um, and I think that we are in a position where we can begin to return to practice now. Before I go on to our perspective as ENT surgeons, I would also just comment on the NHS England comments regarding return to practice. I accept it's a community document that they have published, and we've got to be a little bit careful about this. I have tried to contact them. Um, you can't get through on the phone. I've emailed them, that their director of community care, to see if we get a response. But they have directed that till the end of July, uh, audiology clinics should be stopped. I'm sure you've read that. Um, and a lot of audiology services should be reduced. Now, this is an issue for us because of my own opinion, and it is a personal opinion, is that's now probably overcautious. It was utterly and completely the right decision to make when that document was written in, in the middle of, of March, and even perhaps when it was updated at the beginning of April. I think now it's possibly overly cautious. But when we're returning to practice, we do have to be aware that that's a national guideline. It's a guideline and no more. Uh, and, and I think everyone just should be aware of it. Now, coming on to what perhaps is of more interest to you is um, how we have approached this. Now, I'll share our national guidelines with you when they're fully um, audited, as it were, by our team. We're hoping to get ours submitted by the end of this week and published, I'm hoping, next week. But if we just think about the ear canal anatomy, I've got some very reassuring things to say <laughs> and some slightly less uh, reassuring things to say. The first thing is that the ear canal doesn't contain coronavirus. So that's a really good start. Um, if you've got an intact tympanic membrane and you want to clean wax from an ear, you're not going to get coronavirus from the ear itself. Your main issue is going to be social distancing. So you are going to be closer than two meters to the patient's mouth and nose, and they're going to be closer to yours, of course, as well. And that's something you're both going to have to think about. You know, do you have health problems? Does your client or patient have health problems? Have either of you had any risk factors? Be really, really careful uh, when thinking about approaching the patient. Now, the second thing we need to think about is if there's a tympanic membrane perforation. This is difficult. We're doing, we've got a number of projects we've launched to try and work out what's going on here. We don't have evidence as to whether or not there is a coronavirus COVID-19 infection in the middle of mucosa, but it's almost certain there is. There's certainly old publications showing that other types of coronavirus do reside in the middle ear mucosa uh, when they're in the nasopharynx. So therefore, it's highly likely they're there for people who are infected. And remember that a very small number of your patients may have asymptomatic infection. Now, if you have someone with a dry tympanic membrane, intuitively, your risk of getting a coronavirus infection through that tympanic membrane, I would have thought is vanishingly small. Don't have evidence, but I would have thought it's vanishingly small. But if you've got a patient with a wet ear, who you're trying to clear their ear, I think you need to be a little bit, well, I'm certainly going to be a little bit cautious because we don't know whether that material contains viable uh, coronavirus particles, and it may do. And although suctioning is, again, a difficult area, if you look at the Public Health England guidelines, suction of anywhere in the upper area digestive tract is considered an air generating procedure. And we we argued over this sentence with Public Health England for quite a long time. Uh, and ultimately, they didn't put air in as part of the upper respiratory tract. But you can certainly consider the eustachian tube and middle ear mucosa as part of the upper respiratory tract. So when we're giving guidance to colleagues on whether it's safe to suction a middle ear, you just need to be aware of that. And there is a possibility that there may be virus in, in the middle ear. So I think that 
if you're going to suction an ear um, or you're going to put a mold in or whatever you're going to do you just need to be aware if there's a perforation particularly if it's wet um that there is the possibility that there is there is virus in that that area so that's the sort of the downside um regarding testing my own opinion again is reasonably firm that i think that we can now return to most forms of testing uh this has got to be okayed by the rest of our committee but you know, social distancing is going to be the principal problem. And of course, cleaning all of your equipment meticulously is going to be an issue as well. And because of that, the number of people we're going to be able to test is going to be much reduced. So we're going to have to be really clear that everything will have to be wiped down and cleaned afterwards. And if you've got a patient who you think may have a risk of being infective, i.e. they've got a wet ear or they've had a recent cough, your, the guidelines at the moment so that you'll have to leave the room empty for an hour after that patient's been in there then completely clean the room before you can go back in there so there's quite a lot to think about and in a way what i'm saying is there's more uncertainty than there's certainty and i think we all need to be really very careful for our own health and for our patients health we may be more sensitive to it because of the experiences we've had as ENT surgeons we've had overall five or six surgeons die in the NHS so far with this uh, and we don't want anyone else to but having said that we also feel very strongly we're really worried about all our patients who we haven't seen and I think we do need to restart um, restart practice now so if I summarize I would say congratulations to you all really genuinely congratulations for putting this document together I think it's a great document I think it's really well written I think it's really sensible I think it's really helpful for everyone. Um, our document will have many similar themes running through it, so we'll be able to support you and you'll be able to support us on that. But I've just put this caveat at the end that we're not out of this. This is a virus that you need to be careful of, we need to be careful of. And I think we just need to think very carefully on a patient by patient basis when we're seeing people and how we can how we can minimize risk. Uh, I hope, is, is that a helpful sort of introduction to my thoughts from a sort of ENT surgeon's perspective? I think it really is. Um, I think from our perspective in the guidance, we took your advice and absolutely said that at the moment people shouldn't be suctioning on anything that isn't an intact eardrum. So if you're not sure if you think it's got a perforation, we should leave that alone for now. Um, and I think for us, the um, cough reflex was about the clinician and the patient wearing a mask if we felt there was going to be a cough reflex. And obviously, the first thing we've asked people to do is screen for any COVID symptoms. So reduce that risk even further by only seeing people that have no symptoms at the moment, which we know doesn't eliminate the risk, does it? But it reduces it significantly for us. So. Yeah. Um, I think that was really great, and we look forward to seeing your guidance. Um, yes, it'll be out. I'm working hard on it still. I'm hoping it'll be out in the next week or two. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I know you haven't got much time with us. Um, we've generally recommended a, a fluid resistant mask, and yes. somebody's just asking me if a face shield would be okay if they were wearing a, a cloth mask because um, they couldn't get fluid resistant. You can't get fluid resistant marks for love nor money. Um, it's all been directed, I mean, from an NHS perspective, you can, but if you're independent mm -hmm. practitioners, it's, it's almost impossible to. You can, I got some FFP2 masks online for my own practice uh, this week, but they're, they're expensive. Um, and another thing I would just mention about masks for, for everyone listening, because some of you, I'm sure, will be doing an afternoon of clinics. You can't touch the mask. It's absolutely critical you don't touch the mask. So what you can't do is put a mask on, have a patient come in, do your stuff, put the mask down and put it back up because that's an enormously high risk thing to do. Because if you're breathing in and out, you're concentrating any viruses in the room on your mask. If you touch that mask, your fingers are then covered in virus. And if you go up and down, you're then releasing virus into the environment around your nose and mouth. So if you're going to put a mask on, you've got to wear it and you've got to know how to properly take it off and on, don and doff it. So have a look up at the guidelines on how to do that. Um, wearing a visor, yeah, okay, so for visors are important. Before you see your first patients back in the real world, 
try out the visors. Make sure you can actually use a microscope with them because some of them are really stiff and you'll suddenly find you can't use your microscope. So make sure you've tried several different types and you've cleaned them appropriately between use. Um, I, you know, the guidelines are floor a fluid resistant mask. I think for general audiological testing and practice where you're not microsuctioning, I, I, I think that it, you know, the, the guidelines are softer than that. Um, most masks should be okay in that circumstances, uh, particularly not too yeah. close to the patient. Um, we're also getting quite a lot of questions around the room cleaning. Were you talking about somebody that has had a, a COVID symptom when you talked about the room being left? Uh, this is a, okay. These are really good questions and they're really difficult. And if you look at the guidelines, they look at the volume of the room, the air turnover. Yeah, I mean, it, certainly from an NHS perspective, we've really discussed this. We're not going to be able to retrofit rooms with um, air ventilators and so on. This is, it's just completely impractical to be able to do that. And the standalone air filters, by the way, that you can buy to filter air, that they're not adequate. They won't filter adequately. I've looked into that as well, even though they've got the proper filters in them, they're not adequate. So I, essentially what I'm saying is for a standard patient, you, you know, you can have them in and out and we don't really understand the, the difference in timing there. For a patient who has a wet ear or has an aerosol generating procedure, i.e. you're suctioning a wet ear, where there is any significant risk or any remote risk of COVID infection, the room needs to be vacated for an hour, then cleaned by cleaners with no one in there before the next patient can be seen. That's yeah, the so so if we're not function, suctioning um, wet ears at all, which is what's in our guidance, um, yeah. yeah, and we're trying to screen out anybody that may have COVID symptoms, um, we shouldn't have to leave the room. That, that, but that's we exactly. should have time to clean surfaces and things in between. Yes, you're going to, there's no yeah. doubt about it, you're going to have to leave longer between um, cases. So it, it, it's going to be a challenge. I mean, I think you're going to find there's a lot fewer people going to want to come in initially because people are really scared at the moment of coming into hospital. They don't want to come in, but it'll gradually pick up over the next few months, I hope. Yeah, I think that was our feeling as we wrote the guidance that we can put guidance out and it gives people time to build confidence with their patient group again um, and get their procedures in place to make sure we can keep social distancing until we actually need to go in and do a test or a, a looking in ear. Um, so that's great. Brilliant. It's really important for everyone to be aware that the excellent guidelines you put out are guidance. What we're going to put out are guidance and what public health what, what uh, nhs england put out is guidance and there's a difference between guidance and protocol um so guidance is to guide and you and i and everyone else as a clinician and individual has ultimate responsibility um you know, we have to make a decision based upon that guidance but we're not being told what to do we're being guided what to do yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you ever so much. I know you have to leave us um, to get somewhere else, as I recall. Well, thank you um, very much. So thank you ever so much for coming. Great pleasure. OK, cheerio. All right, thank Bye. you. Bye. OK, so um, I don't think Jenny, Professor Jenny Wilson has joined us just yet. Um, so we'll move on if we can. Um, and we were looking at um, questions submitted prior to the um, prior to the webinar first. We've generally been able to um, to categorise these because um, they were very similar questions. I hope you found it really interesting to hear um, Professor Ray talk around this whole element of being able to. Um, risk assess yourself and to put protocols and procedures in place. Um, I know that the guidance, some of you felt it was, you were able to open, some of you have felt that you haven't managed the risk and that you won't have patients that want to come out. That's absolutely fine. We're not telling everybody that they should open today. What we're saying to people is the guidance will hopefully help you to work into that new, I'm gonna have to say it, that new normal I'm not ready for a new normal yet, so I'm calling it the new Norman, but we are going to have to work into that. So my question um, that I'm going to answer is how do I decide I need to see a patient or a customer? I is it clinically necessary? So our argument is that audiology is clinically necessary. So we would say that there's a really great flowchart in the um 
in the guidance that helps you to work through levels of um, risk. So can I do this by phone? Is it just a packet of batteries? Is it something I can talk them through and they can manage? And if it isn't and they have a clinical need, so they, they need their hearing testing, they need some wax removing um, and you've managed the risks, then you need to talk to the patient a little bit around their risk assessment for themselves. I would say that you need to start thinking with patients about what would be the safest way for them to get to you. If they're older, do they really want to come out yet or can they leave it a little bit longer? Um, all of those things. Um, and there was a line about domiciliary care, which was absolutely essential. So in people's shielding guidance and the letters that they received from the government, if they were shielding, that was the official line. Is the appointment with your medical practitioner, the person doing a medical need, absolutely essential? And that's actually for the patient to judge. So if you're having a conversation and you're explaining what you can and can't do, but remotely, what you can and can't do for them now, and they still deem that it's absolutely essential to be seen, even if they're in a household which is shielding in some way, they can choose, but it has to be the patient that chooses. If you can do it in any sort of remote way, then that's the recommendation to start with at the moment. So there should be a next question, which is to Andrew. Hello, everyone. Um, so my question is specifically around uh, PPE. Um, so, so if you can just jump to the next slide for me. So in terms of uh, questions around PPE in terms of why the guidance has changed a little bit, um, this guidance was aimed at dealing with asymptomatic patients, uh, which have been uh, identified through a robust triage process with best in practice infection controls and then appropriate PPE related to the activity that you were completing. Each stage of, of the guidance was is to mitigate any risk. Um, and PPE really is the last line of defense after triage and, and really great infection controls. Um, in terms of specifications for each PPE item, you can find these on the gov.uk website, and you do need to make sure that any of the PPE that you're sourcing um, falls in line with these guidance, uh, these specifications. Um, although the guidance gives clear direction on what to wear and when, it's up to the individual to feel uh, if they, they want to go above the guidance. And any PPE that is used is only effective if it is correctly fitted. Um, and the correct donning and doffing procedures are followed. In relation to masks, again, there are higher grade masks available, but they require fit testing really to be effective. So you have to consider absolutely everything uh, when you're deciding what uh, you are going to use. Um, there's a little bit about how to get, uh, a question around how to get uh, PPE. Um, Ultimately, there, there are a few options, certainly for those working in the independent sector, um, that you can order this individually, as uh, Professor Ray said, it is uh, certainly pretty expensive. Uh, there is options for, for getting together as a group of people to look at a bulk order of, of potential PPE. And we have heard that some manufacturers are, are offering to, to, to sort of order PPE for, for uh, businesses. Um, so it's worth checking out a number of different ways of how you can access it. Uh, backing up what, what Professor Ray said, it's important to have standard operating procedures in place to understand exactly when you would use this PPE and, and how. Um, there is a table here that we are, are going to be developing a series of frequently asked questions that will go into that, which gives a breakdown of the specifications that you would need for each of the uh, different types of PPE and, and uh, hand sanitizer and soap and things like that, that you should be using in clinic. Um, one of the other questions we had was around how to put uh, PPE on, so the donning and doffing correctly, as uh, Professor Ray mentioned. There are videos uh, to this or that show this on the gov.uk website. Um, it's really incumbent on you before you open any, uh, to any fully understand how to uh, don and doff PPE correctly and reflect on your individual practices to the best way of doing that. 
Um, an example of how you might use uh, to, to put PPE on, you know, obviously you would triage the appointment before attending, and at that point you're likely to understand whether there is a potential for PPE to be required before the patient turns up. Um, really, you should perform as much information gathering over the phone or at a distance. Um, when they then come into practice, um, you conduct as much as possible of that consultation at a two meter distance. And then if it's required for you to go within those, that two meters, you then need to don your PPE. So you stop the appointment, put the PPE on, and then return to your patient and work within that two meter distance, ideally uh, completing all critical activities in one go to minimize contact time. Um, then you, you, you can step away from the, the patient and, and go through the process of removing PPE. There is the uh, idea of then cleaning things like chairs and, and potentially even booze, as well as all the additional uh, touch points like chair handles, door handles. Um, we specifically had some questions around soft fabric chairs. You know, really before uh, opening to the public or bringing anybody in, you should be looking at your practice and understanding where these risky points are and ideally having seat coverings um, or plastic seat coverings or different chairs that are easy to clean. Um, we're not necessarily going to go through a series of different examples, but you should reflect on your own clinic environment and seek to remove areas that, uh, or, or items that can't be cleaned easily. Um, for somewhere like a soundproof booth, that could be that, you know, if it's particularly small, maybe it's safer to conduct the, the uh, PTA in the room rather than putting them into a booth. You know, maybe it's you need to cover parts of the booth with a thin plastic. It, there's lots of different ways that you need to reflect on your own environment and understand the best way of mitigating any risk. Um, remembering that we are seeing people who are asymptomatic, that we've triaged appropriately and, uh, and are following really strict infection control procedures. Um, just to reiterate what uh, Professor Ray said, you should be using this guidance to develop your own standard operating procedures specific to your clinic environment and how that fits in with, with uh, the appropriate amount of PPE. Um, really, you should identify using the guidance and using your own um, risk assessment within your practice. Thanks, Sue. Sorry, I just want to say that I'm struggling a little bit to see people's questions and I don't really understand why. Um, so I don't know where people are sending them. Um, so I am struggling. Have we clicked all attendees? I just, I genuinely can't see very many questions and I know there are some coming in. So we've had a question about, is there a cleaning protocol? Is there a protocol for cleaning? Um, that's in the guidance in terms of clinic readiness. Karen, you might have to come in and. There, well, oh, there is a there. Are, sorry, there is a, a link to uh, cleaning of clinical uh, clinical environments within the guidance, and then there is some guidance in the clinical operating uh, procedures as well. Um, and as I say, the other one is um, after a day in clinic, can I go home in the clothes I've been practicing in? Best practice, um, best practice guidance as far as we can um, point you to is saying that it would be better if you didn't, if you had the um, option to change, it would be a better thing to do. Um, and that was certainly coming from Impre Infection Prevention Society, which again is linked in the guidance. Um, I'm just trying to read down. Um, if limited contact, should we be carrying out REMS? Um, my feeling is you risk assess that on the particular patient that you're doing. Going back to click and fit ways of working isn't a great thing, is it? Um, we've, we've kind of moved away from click and fit. So the feeling would be you could limit contact, um, but the actual time with a patient isn't the limiting factor. It's about proximity to the, to the patient. So once you get close in, you should be wearing the appropriate PPE to complete the things that you want in that particular um, in that particular session. So if you're doing a fitting appointment, it may only be the um, it may only be the guidance. Um, it's just about moving on from there. So let's move on with what we have got in. So this is one for Ronnie.
Aaron, are you there? Hi, Ronnie. No. Ronnie, I'm afraid we can't hear you. Hi again. No. Can Karen or Andrew take this one? Um, in terms of, um, oh, in terms yeah. of. Um, insurance. Ultimately, uh, the, the simple answer is you need to check out with your insurer uh, about your individual uh, setting, um, and your individual policy. It's it's a relatively simple question to to, to pick up. Um, I, it, you wouldn't see why not, uh, but you absolutely need to check with your own insurance company and with your own policy to make sure that everything you do is in line with with what they would advise. Okay. Um... Just uh, wanted to say that we are going to be able to download all of your questions um, at the end of the session, so we should be able to um, we should be able to go through some of those um, in the FAQs as well that we put out. So this one was for you, Karen, um, to take uh -huh. from the group. Thank you very much. So. Um... Obviously, um, when we're talking about restarting services now, we're definitely not talking about restarting normal services and at the normal rate. You've already heard from Professor Ray about um, reducing patient volumes that you see, spacing out the appointments to allow for cleaning. Obviously, within your appointments, you will need to decide what element you can do at a distance and what element you will do close contact and giving yourself the right amount of time within that to do your donning and doffing, which has become our favourite words. Um, and certainly in terms of moving away from saying uh, urgent and essential to where there is audiological need, um, we have already made very clear in the guidance that we would always look to see, can we deliver a service remotely first or in a no contact way? And there have been a number of questions around this theme and how that can be delivered and what can be done. Um, and a couple of years ago, when we did one of our first collaborative conferences, we actually talked about being connected and using uh, the play on the word of connected to also reference technology as well as people. And the technology we knew even a couple of years ago or so, would change quite dramatically and would have an impact on our service delivery. And so I think this current situation has definitely seen that that has been escalated much faster than perhaps we would have normally done. But we've certainly seen a lot of different manufacturers um, start to work very quickly on how to support remote assessment, remote fittings and so forth. Um, Again, the guidance that we have put together gives you a framework, but it doesn't give you a, you must do this, you must do that. It is up to you and your services to decide how to prioritise, what you can deliver, um, and what tools and support mechanisms you might want to put into place. So clearly, looking at kind of telehealth models definitely makes sense. Using pre kind of questionnaires, remote questioning, but even before the patient arrives into clinic um, would also be really helpful. Um, BAA and MANCAD have actually been working furiously, and I use the word furiously, um, because they have developed a real wealth of information on support for remote services. Um, and that will be launched to you imminently. Um, and that covers um, specialist provision for paediatric, for vestibular, for adult work, for hearing aid programming and telehealth and so on. So we've broken it down into sections because it was such a mammoth piece of work. Um, it's very well uh, referenced and researched um, and some of it we still need the evidence base to evolve, but that is really the situation that we are in, an evolving service. So BAA have already made a commitment amongst heads of services to share best practice and to share workarounds. And I think collaboratively, we definitely want to be able to do that. So as any of you try any innovative practice, um, and it works and it creates efficiencies and allows you um, a customer patient need with, while they can still stay in the safety of their own home, then that would be welcomed and please do share that with us. Um, 
we will send out links and so on to that remote guidance, but we hope that that will be really useful for you as well. So I think that's all I wanted to say on that moment. Thank you. Okay, so we've come to the end of the submitted questions. I know there's quite a lot um, that are coming in on the chat box and um, I would suggest that we all go on there. The FF, let's, um, right. I would suggest that people join me from the panel in having their mics open and I'll try and find as much of these as I can. Um, there were questions around um, is an apron sufficient when ENT UK guidance recommends a disposal surgical gown? Um, I think uh, we've had that answered quite well by Professor Ray in that he was saying quite specifically that the ear canal does not contain coronavirus. Um, so in terms of risk management, um, that will remove some of the risk um, of, of that procedure. Um, we're being asked about different types of wax procedure. Um, that's all about so in terms of different types of wax, wax procedure, it states in the guidance that it, in the table uh, that it would be any procedure, um, whether it's microsuction, um, irrigation or manual removal. Provided there's no, there's not a perforation. And I think it, it, that's the important bit, isn't it? Is it comes down to the triage that you use before you make any decision to see any patient for any service in clinic and you've excluded that you can help them remotely. Um, the triage that you put in place is really important. So it's not just the triage for corona symptoms, but also for the specific service that you want to deliver. So where you feel that there are contraindications or there's a known history of uh, middle ear cavity and wet ear management and so on, they are definitely not the people that we're going to be inviting into the clinic. We would still want to point them to an ENT service. Um, so it's about excluding whatever possible um, and just you, those that are going to present minimal risk but have an audiological need that you are able to service to with your confidence and safety and the patients. Okay, there's a question about home visits. There's an appendix that's all about how you make home visits safe um, and it takes guidance from the... Um, it takes guidance from the documents the government released last week on that um, particular topic. It's really well written guidance and I would personally urge you to click on that link that's in the appendix and read that um, because I think it's some of the best written guidance on home visiting that I've ever seen um, and it will allow you to build your own risk assessment and clinical protocol based on that. But visits should not be off the table if the patient can't attend your clinic. You're more at risk than the patient in the home visit situation because the patient is not coming out. Um, so as I say, it's, it is about how you manage the risk um, for yourself. And that's why there is an increase in the PPA, uh, PPE guidance when you're doing a home visit. I think what's really important about uh, about, about the, the guidance is there are lots of links in it. You know, if we if we put the every bit of link, every bit of information to each of those links, you would be here. For a lot, the document would be very very long. So it's important that at all points that you click through the links and read and understand the government guidance that backs up the advice that we have given. Um, the, the the document is there to facilitate you to access all this information. Um, you could never create a, a document that would do absolutely everything. Um, but it, 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 you need to then read all of all of the guidance, the links that relate to your specific environment, and then reflect on how you apply that to your individual setting. Yeah, I think it's important that you remember that this also says that this is about what your um, what your environment allows you to do as well. Um, so there, it's very clearly stated in the guidance that you also need to talk to your own infection prevention if you're in a hospital setting, for example, and your own employers as well. This is guidance um, that can be used within those settings, in it, within any setting to set your own protocol.
Um, I'm just trying to read the chat box, but <laughs> I think there's some questions there about taking temperature. Um, from the sampling that we've done of various services and, and, and the guidance, um, it isn't necessarily practical um, to be able to do that or necessary. Again, as Sue said, some local trusts may require that. Um, the, the anecdotal is if the customer's chest or back feels hot to touch in a sustained way, then they have a raised temperature. And so that, again, would be part of your triage questions. Um, what else have we got here? Um, if the patient's been using oil in preparation for wax removal, it will appear wet. Does this mean you cannot carry out a wax removal procedure? No, by wet, um, Professor Ray was referring to a middle ear connection to the ear. So he was talking about um, the wetness coming from the mucosa of the middle ear, um, not just that the fluid with the ear wax was wet so it's ruling out that perforation more than anything else okay so what other questions so can I, other people so, see uh, Sorry, so I'll just pick up that one about Bisha picking up um, the recommend the table um, in the guidance is the is a recommendation of the PPE to use, uh, and then the specifications are um, are with are set within government guidance. Um, it it would be really challenging for Bisha to facilitate a massive bulk purchase of of PPE and then. Uh, to to deliver that to everyone, it's like more easier. Probably going to be easier if people do this in groups around their loca locality, um, or you know, and, and look at it that way. I do, as I say, from some conversations, there are some um, manufacturers that are looking at potentially uh, purchasing some PPE, so it's worth reaching out to them also. Um. So I think some of the questions that we're getting um, definitely relate to individual procedures. This guidance was not trying to define every individual procedure in audiology. Um, and I'm sure the rest of the panel will back me up on this. We were trying to define um, proximity to the patient um, rather than giving us individual guidance for every single procedure that you guys are doing. And I think that's absolutely right. We did start trying to do that. <laughs> But given that um, the guidance is across all sectors and all professions, it is actually very difficult to cap capture every type of procedure that you might do. Um, so I think as a, as a local service and as a local team, what you would do is to go through your own priorities of which group of patients you think are suitable to see right now. Um, if that is their choice and they want to come in, and as we say again, you can't help it, can't help them remotely. Um, and then with those procedures, you work out what would be safe to deliver either remotely before they arrive or at the two meter separation in a separate area. And then when you are going to invite them into the room to do a clinical procedure that's within two meters, um, it is about then that the patient understands that they are to wait outside until they're invited in to the room and you're ready and then whatever the procedure is so whether that is that you've chosen to do really a measure and you need to be within two meters or it's wax removal or impressions or testing whatever it might be um then you make sure that you are donned with your ppe your equipment is set up it's all about minimizing your contact time um it's also worth we already know that there's lots of um talk now and uh, Kevin Monroe has published some stuff on the the interference of communication with face masks which of course is no surprise but all those unintended consequences of that so I would definitely advocate that when you are at a safe distance and talking with your patients outside of the consulting room that you do all of your explanations and questions and then inform them that as you go into the room um, that you will keep the chat to an absolute minimum so that you're just getting on with the procedure so you can tell them what to expect. Um, bring them in, do the procedure and then ask them to return outside. Obviously, 
if you've invited them to use a face mask, depending on what you're doing in the room, they will don that in your clinical waste facility, wash their hands before they leave the room. But you don't go back out to them until you are ready till you've updated your record, you've donned your own, uh, doffed your own PPP, PPE and cleaned your room down, etc. So again, look at all of that guidance and the videos, the training that's there, because the procedure, the order for doing that is really critical too. Okay. All right, so I think, go on, Andrew. I, I was going to say, was I think that, that there seems to be a lot of questions um, in there, and obviously we will not be absolutely exhausted of answers for you, um, or we don't have the time to give you them on this webinar because it's almost time for it to be up. But the plan is to use those questions to, to produce a, a frequently asked questions document that will be, you know, there'll be a general one, and, and where we need to, we'll, we'll specify into different um, membership bodies uh, for specific guidance. Um, but yeah, it's uh, uh, that's all I was going to say, Sue because it was coming to an end in case you'd lost track you know yeah all right so we are going to finish there um as i say the meeting will be recorded we'll record the chat anything that we haven't seen we'll um we'll try and send them to you um we'll try and answer and put them together as as frequently asked questions one last word from all of us please read all of the guidance read the links follow the links do due to diligence as a professional and make some clinical judgment decisions. Is that a good note to end on, everybody? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, thank thank you support. everyone for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I thought I'd like watching the numbers come down, but I must stop the recording. That'd be the one thing to do, wouldn't it?